Greetings, true believers, and welcome to another astonishing episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This week's tale begins roughly one million years ago before the evolution of modern man. One fateful day, the ape-like ancestors of mankind beheld a sight their primitive minds couldn't hope to understand. An alien vessel so incomprehensibly large that it filled the skies above them. The Elder God, Gaia, observed these events, and although she was one of the Earth's first deities, the beings on board the massive starship were far older. They were known as the Celestials, and while they are often referred to as space gods, they were far more powerful than any known pantheon. Originating from the first universe, the Celestials' physical forms manifested as massive armored figures, standing 2,000 feet tall. To put their power into perspective, during this trip to Earth, the Celestials were attacked by a gathering of gods, heroes, and monsters who had encountered their kind before. This team included an ancient Iron Fist, a caveman with the power of the Star Brand, a woman infused with the Phoenix Force, Odin, the king of the Norse gods, a prehistoric black panther, a ghost rider atop a flaming mammoth, and the Vishanti known as Agamotto. To say this team battled the Celestials would be inaccurate. There was no battle. Odin and his forces attacked, and the space gods simply defeated them without effort and went about their business. The Celestials were interested in creation and evolution, and thus their first host on Earth had come to experiment on humanity's ape-like ancestors. Gamennon the Gatherer tranquilized and collected many test subjects, scooping them up into their enormous palm. Another Elder God, Set, sent his own creations, the Serpent Men, hoping the Celestials would bestow their gifts onto his children. However, Erishem the Judge deemed the Serpents unworthy and drove them away. The Chosen Primates were brought onto the Celestial Vessel where Zirin the Tester began their work, analyzing and experimenting on the creature's genetic code. Zirin's subjects were left misshapen and monstrous, and fled to underground caverns upon release. This violent new race became known as the Deviants, and they carved out a vast network of underground tunnels that would eventually be used by the likes of Tyrannus and the Mole Man. Other subjects were examined by another celestial, Oneg the Prober. They were released seemingly as they came, although they were instilled with great genetic potential that would one day manifest in their descendants in the form of random mutation. However, this video's focus will be on those examined by Nezar the Calculator. Infused with cosmic energy, this group of 100 individuals were transformed into the godlike beings known as the Eternals. At first wanting little to do with the rest of humanity, the Eternals took to the mountaintops to develop and learn to control their superhuman powers. Each Eternal possessed a wide range of abilities including strength, flight, telepathy, teleportation, illusion casting, matter transmutation, and energy projection. Individuals could also focus their energies into one facet of their powers, training to increase the strength of one ability by decreasing the power of others. They are also virtually immortal. While they can die, it is almost always temporary. Even if the molecules of their bodies were scattered, they would eventually regenerate. With their experiments complete, the Celestials left the Earth, intending to one day return to observe the results of their labor. The Eternals eventually built their first stronghold, the city of Titanos. 600,000 years ago, they were led by two of their number, Kronos and Uranos, but a disagreement brewed between them. While Kronos wished simply to live in peace, Uranos wanted them to use their power to conquer the world around them. This led to a savage civil war between the Eternals with Kronos and his ally Oceanus battling against Uranos and his rebels. Eventually, Uranos and his forces were defeated and exiled from the Earth. Disgusted by the violence he was forced to participate in, Kronos shattered his weapon and swore never again to engage in war. Seeking a new place to settle, Uranos and his followers discovered an alien outpost, fittingly on the planet which would someday be known as Uranus. 
The outpost was guarded by a large sentry robot, but Uranos and his followers were able to defeat it. After gathering alien technology from the outpost, Uranos ordered the creation of a spacecraft so they could return to Earth and seek revenge on Kronos. By this time, several of Uranos' followers had turned against him and remained behind on Uranus. However, the fallen sentry robot was soon investigated by members of the alien race who had built it, the Kree. As the Uranian vessel passed by the planet Saturn, it was attacked and destroyed by Kree starships. One of the Eternals on board was then captured and dissected by the Kree. From this, the Kree learned of mankind's great genetic potential, which eventually led to their own experiments and the creation of the Inhumans. As for Uranos and the rest of his followers, they survived and settled on Saturn's moon, Titan, where they established their own colony. Back on Earth, about a hundred thousand years after the war with Uranos, Kronos was performing experiments of his own, examining the cosmic energies which gave he and his fellow Eternals their power. In a tragic miscalculation, Kronos underestimated the forces he was attempting to contain. A mammoth explosion shook the city of Titanos, and Kronos' body was completely disintegrated. But Kronos did not die, and instead ascended into a new form of being not unlike a cosmic entity. It was once believed that this eruption of cosmic energy is what imbued the Eternals of Titanos with immortality, but it has since been posited that they were always immortal and that this event merely increased their power. In either case, no longer possessing a corporeal body, Kronos left leadership of the Eternals to his two sons, Zurus and Aelars. It should also be noted that recently it has been established that Eternals cannot truly have children with other Eternals and that familial connections between them are actually adopted. And it has also been recently revealed that 200,000 years ago, Zurus and Aelars had a disagreement of their own with Aelars believing that the Eternals should find some way to procreate with one another. In order to decide which of them would become the Prime Eternal, the Eternals joined together forming the Unimind. They collectively chose Zurus to lead them, and Aelars was subsequently exiled. Some sources claim that Aelars chose this fate for himself to prevent another war, while others imply that a war did happen between them. Wandering the stars, Aelars eventually came upon the colony on Titan that was built by Uranos and his people, and found it in ruin. It seems that their attempt at building a peaceful civilization of their own had failed, and by the time Aelars had arrived, only one Eternal remained there, a woman by the name of Sui San. Together, Aelars and Sui San rebuilt Titan, populating it with genetic engineering, cloning technology, and alien travelers. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Zurus oversaw the construction of several eternal cities of his own. There was Oceana in the Pacific, Polaria in the area now called Siberia, and their capital city in the mountains of Greece, Olympia. As for the Deviants, they had established their own empire operating out of their capital city, Lemuria. In their expansion, the Deviants had enslaved many humans and ruled them like kings. Not all of them were equally sinister, however, and one Deviant by the name of Crow developed an attraction towards Zuras's daughter, Azura. His feelings were somewhat reciprocated, but they were from two different worlds. And then, roughly 20,000 years ago, the Space Gods returned as the second host. But the deviant Emperor Fraug had struck a bargain with the Elder God Set and believed himself to be unstoppable. In their arrogance, the deviants fired on the celestial craft. On board, Ereshem observed this behavior and passed their judgment upon them. The celestials unleashed an attack the likes of which the Earth had never seen. In a single moment, the Deviant Empire was completely destroyed, and the city of Lemuria sank beneath the waves. The entire planet shook, and the resulting devastation would be remembered for tens of thousands of years as the Great Cataclysm. Many humans and animals who lived on the continent of Lemuria survived the Flood by fleeing aboard a wooden ark. 
and were guided to safety by a flying Eternal. It was also during the time of the second host that one of the Celestials, Tiamut the Communicator, was deemed by the others to be a traitor and a renegade. Tiamat believed that Erisham's decision to destroy only the Deviants was faulty and concluded that they needed to overthrow the Celestial Judge and assume command. However, the other Celestials sided with Erisham and placed Tiamat into a deep slumber. Tiamat was buried underground beneath the mountains where they would one day be known as the Dreaming Celestial. After the coming of the second host, the Deviants were unable to reclaim their dominance. This is partly because the Eternals began taking a more active role in pushing back the Deviants with some of their encounters inspiring the myths of man. During this time, one Eternal, the same one who guided the Ark during the Great Cataclysm, took a human wife and the two had a child together. While the Eternals cannot have children with each other, they are indeed able to interbreed with humans. However, these children, called Nephilites, are not Eternals themselves. Such was the case with the child named Icarus, who envied his father's power of flight. The Eternal provided his son with a winged harness, but because of his battles with the Deviants, he was away for years at a time, and did not teach Icarus how to properly use them. Tired of waiting, the boy donned his flying device and took to the skies unsupervised. He soared high, too high in fact, where the air was thin, and he fainted on the edge of space before plummeting back to Earth. His eternal father found the boy's body some time later and, wishing to honor his son's memory, took his name and became known as Icarus. Another eternal hero was the reclusive warrior known only as the Interloper. The Interloper battled a cosmic entity called the Dragon of the Moon and also fought alongside King Arthur in the 6th century. Perhaps the most famous Eternal throughout the millennia was a hero known to the Eternals as the Forgotten One. Humans sometimes misidentified the Forgotten One as legendary figures such as Hercules or Samson, but he was most commonly known as Gilgamesh. This wasn't the only time the Eternals were mistaken for the gods of Olympus, and Zeus was often conflated with Zeus. Many Olympians were annoyed by the misattribution, and so Zeus and Zeus forged a pact of non-interference between their peoples. As a sign of respect, Zeus' daughter Azura changed her name to Thena in honor of Zeus' daughter Athena. Speaking of Thena, about 2,500 years ago she participated in a battle against the Deviants in the city of Babylon. There she encountered Crow, who had proven to be far more long-lived than the other Deviants. Crow survived through the millennia, subtly altering his appearance and posing as his own descendants. But Crow and Thena would not fight, instead admitting their love for one another. However, their people were at war, and so again it wasn't meant to be. And the Olympians weren't the only gods of Earth that the Eternals would interact with. Roughly 1,000 years ago, the Asgardian Thor met several Eternals, including Ajak, Vulcan, Druig, and Varako, who was considered Icarus's father. This occurred in South America, where Ajak had interacted with the Inca under the name Tecumatsin. It was there in the Peruvian Andes that Ajak oversaw the construction of a city built to honor the space gods. Together, Thor and the Eternals battled a powerful deviant known as Dramadon. During this battle, Varako was slain, but he has since regenerated in modern times. In the meantime, Vulcan, who was like a brother to Varako, filled the role of Icarus's father. It was shortly after this that the third host arrived at the site of their battle in Peru. Fearing the Thunder God might attempt to do battle with the Celestials, Vulcan wiped his mind of their encounter and sent him on his way. However, three more gods soon arrived to challenge the Celestials, Odin, Zeus, and Vishnu. In retaliation, the Celestials bombarded the godheads with psychic visions of their realms burning, a stern warning against attack. Speaking on behalf of the Celestials, Ajak informed the three gods that Erishem the Judge would destroy the connections between the Earth and their godly realms unless they pledged not to interfere in celestial business for the next thousand years. Knowing full well this was no empty threat, the godheads bowed to the Celestials. 
However, Odin suspected a battle with the Celestials was inevitable, and began forging several weapons to aid him, one of which was inspired by the space god's own cosmic armor, the Destroyer. It was also during the time of the Third Host that the war between the Eternals and the Deviants was put on hold, as an agreement was reached for each to leave humanity to their own devices until the Fourth Host arrived. Ajak and his followers sealed themselves within the City of the Space Gods to await the day he would one day awaken and again serve as the communicator for the Celestials. Zurus also ordered Icarus to train his senses so that when the Celestials returned, they would be prepared. For centuries, the Eternals and Deviants on Earth were relatively dormant while Aelars' colony on Titan had flourished. Aelars had taken the name Mentor, and he and Sui San married. With the help of Mentor's father, Kronos, the two discovered a method of circumventing eternal biology to have children of their own. This was accomplished through the use of a pair of energy-manipulating rings known as the Quantum Bands. However, their first child was born with the Deviant Syndrome. Holding her newborn in her arms, Sui San went mad and nearly killed the child then and there. Some might say they had more luck with their second child, Eros, who grew into the hero Star Fox. While their older son, Thanos, fell in love with death and eventually destroyed Mentor's utopia on Titan. But that wasn't the only Eternal colony, as the Eternals who stayed behind on Uranus also built a home there. However, they weren't alone, and native Uranians also lived deep within the planet. And so, the two races made a deal. The Eternals could live in peace on Uranus, as their presence there resulted in byproducts that were useful to the Uranians. However, since these Eternals were criminals, exiles from Earth, they were forbidden from leaving. But after so many millennia, they accomplished everything they could seek to do there and grew bored. Boredom led to depression, but being Eternals, they were unable to even end their own existences. Then, in 1934, the Uranian Eternals received a transmission from Earth, from a man named Matthew Horace Grayson. Grayson was a German scientist, originally named Horace Grabscheid, who defected to the West after Nazis rose to power. After his wife and daughter were killed, he sought to flee the planet with his son Robert before the entire world could descend into war. And miraculously, Grayson was able to make contact with an otherworldly colony, the Uranian Eternals. With help from the colonists, Grayson built a rocket called the Silver Bullet, one capable of making the long journey to Uranus. Grayson was certainly correct that the Earth was becoming a dangerous place, and less than a decade later, the Second World War was in full swing. During this time, under the shadow of war, the Deviants sought to renew their activities. After taking several aliases, including posing as the god Pluto, the deviant warlord Crow sought to gain power through political and criminal means. However, Zurus saw through Crow's disguises and dispatched one of their own to combat him. The eternal speedster Makari was chosen for the task and operated under aliases such as Mercury and Hurricane. To avoid escalating another conflict with the Deviants, Makari intentionally obfuscated his true identity, at one point even claiming he was the son of Thor. The war eventually ended, but Makari continued to foil Crow's plots into the 1950s. It was during this decade that another incredible hero first appeared on Earth, the amazing Marvel Boy, who had come from the planet Uranus. Marvel Boy was, in fact, a grown-up Robert Grayson, the young son of Matthew Horace Grayson, who returned to Earth after being raised in the Eternal Colony on Uranus. The Uranian Eternals also gave Marvel Boy a set of bracelets meant to emulate the Quantum Bands, hoping that his heroics would be the first step to them being allowed to return to Earth. But they didn't trust Grayson completely and began working on a backup plan. They surgically transformed one of their own, an Eternal named Thelius, into a perfect replica of Marvel Boy, and had obtained the real Quantum Bands for him to use. While Grayson had his adventures on Earth, he was unaware that his headband was transmitting his memories into Thelius. 
The native Iranians considered this a violation of their agreement and lashed out at the Iranian Eternals. The resulting despair drew the attention of a creature called Deathurge, a being of dark force energy who embodies self-destruction. Deathurge delivered the final blow to the Iranian colony, killing everyone within. Marvel Boy later returned to Uranus to find his home destroyed. Since he was not bound by the agreements made by the Uranian Eternals, the native Uranians allowed him to join with them, and there he remained for decades. Back on Earth, there was little recorded activity from the Eternals for many years. Shortly after World War II, some Eternals and Deviants joined forces with human scientists to found the Damocles Foundation. Their goal was to study which branch of humanity was destined for dominance, and realized that the increasing number of humans born with the mutant X gene meant that mutant kind was a likely candidate. During the 1960s, Makari and another Eternal, Pixie, joined a superhero group called the First Line. During the Vietnam War, Thena found herself drawn to the conflict where she again met the Deviant Crow. Unable to deny their feelings for each other, the two spent an impassioned night together in the midst of the violence. Thena left in the night while Crow slept and later learned she was pregnant with their Nephilite children. Since the babies would not be true Eternals, she wanted them to lead normal lives and concocted a plan. She found a woman named Mrs. Ritter who was attempting to get pregnant, but was devastated to learn it was unlikely to happen. Thena secretly transferred the embryos from her own body to Ritter, allowing her to have the children. The twins, Deborah and Donald, were born healthy and human, and were raised by the Ritters as their own. Eventually, the Marvel Age of Heroes arrived, and the number of superpowered individuals on Earth began to dramatically increase. By this time, the Eternals of Earth had befriended the Inhumans, the offshoot of humanity created by the Kree. For centuries, the Inhumans had dwelt in the city of Adelan on the Atlantic Ocean, but after so many years, they were in danger of being discovered by humanity. The Eternals aided the Inhumans, helping them move their city to a great refuge in the Himalayas undetected. Meanwhile, several Eternals had integrated themselves into human society, hiding in plain sight. And while it would be some time before the heroes of Earth would meet the Eternals living on their planet, there were encounters with their off-world relatives, such as when Captain Marvel and the Avengers joined with Mentor and Star Fox to oppose Thanos, the Mad Titan. Back on Uranus, Thelius, the Eternal meant to replace Marvel Boy, awakened having survived the Death Urge's massacre. But Thelius was addled and unstable, believing himself to be the real Robert Grayson. His mind constructed false memories to fill in the blanks, and he mistakenly believed that he was not on Uranus when the colony was destroyed. Blaming humanity, he returned to Earth, calling himself the Crusader and battling the Fantastic Four. However, the Crusader underestimated the power of the Quantum Bands and accidentally destroyed himself. The Quantum Bands later came into the possession of the human Wendell Vaughn, who used them to become the hero Quasar. It was during this age that Icarus sensed the approach of the fourth celestial host. Under the name Ike Harris, Icarus joined a human archaeologist and his daughter, Daniel and Margot Damien, to unearth the temple of the space gods in Peru. There, Icarus awakened and greeted Ajak, who had waited in slumber for the past thousand years. And so, the Celestials returned again to observe the progress of their creations. Crow and the Deviants tried to take advantage of this by attempting to trick humanity into turning on the Celestials. Their pact with the Eternals officially expired, the Deviants launched an assault on mankind, hoping humanity would blame the Space Gods. After all, it was attacking the Celestials that led to the destruction of the Deviant Empire 20,000 years prior. However, several Eternals, including Icarus, Makari, and Athena, emerged to fight back the Deviants. And fortunately, Athena was able to talk Crow down from his mad plot. With the help of an anthropologist named Samuel Holden, the Eternals announced their presence to the world and explained their origins. Thanks to Thena, Crow agreed to stand beside them as well. 
Despite this, a panicked S.H.I.E.L.D. agent attacked one of the Celestials with a tactical nuclear device. This of course had no effect on the Space God, but the Celestials then spread out across the planet as Arishem prepared to render his judgment. Meanwhile, in the name of continued peace, Crow brought Fina back to their new Lemuria to meet their current Emperor, Toad. There she witnessed a savage gladiatorial arena where the Deviants pitted those deemed unworthy against one another. This included the human-looking but overly violent Ransack the Reject, as well as a sensitive giant who wished not to fight Carcass. At the same time, Isan the Searcher dove down to observe the Deviant's underwater fortress. Believing they were under attack, a group of panicked Deviants fired upon the Celestial. Isan simply drained the power from Lemuria before analyzing it, destroying it in the process. Before the underwater fortress fell, Thena fled with Carcass and Reject, hoping to help them both. Seeking to strike back against the Celestials, the Deviants constructed a bomb designed to destroy their spacecraft. The Forgotten One, Gilgamesh, thought to stop this in an act of self-sacrifice that impressed the Prime Celestial known as the One Above All. It should be noted that despite their unfathomable power, the Prime Celestial is not the same being as the One Above All which presides over all of existence. Meanwhile, the Eternals formed the Unimind, once again attempting to understand the minds of the Fourth Host. They subsequently engaged several unrelated enemies, such as a robotic Hulk that was accidentally released when the Unimind descended. The destruction from that battle also caused the ancient Deviant Dromedon to be unleashed again, but he was also defeated by the Eternals. After that, a scheming Eternal named Druig also planned to attack the Celestials, but he was stopped by Icarus. The One Above All later sent Gilgamesh, now calling himself Hero, back to Earth to warn the Eternals not to interfere with the Celestials. However, Odin was able to convince both the Eternals and the gods of Olympus to stand with him against the Celestials. At first, the Eternals pushed back against the idea, leading to a battle, but they eventually agreed. To combat the Celestials, the gods of Asgard poured their souls into the Destroyer armor, causing it to match the Space Gods in stature. Charged with the power of the gods, armed with the Asgardian Oversword, and aided by the Eternal Unimind, the Destroyer challenged the fourth Celestial host. For the first time in the history of Earth, the Space Gods seem to have been attacked by a worthy opponent. But appearances can be deceiving, and any damage the Destroyer caused was quickly undone. And thus, one of the most powerful figures ever to walk the Earth was quickly defeated. Erishem prepared to make their judgment, but Thor would not go quietly. In one of the most impressive feats of his immortal life, he toppled the Space God and pierced their celestial armor with the Oversword. Of course, this was little more than an annoyance to the Celestial Judge. But before they rendered their verdict upon the Thunder God, another figure appeared before them. It was Gaia, the benevolent Elder God of Earth who had watched the Celestials' arrival one million years prior. While Odin had spent the last thousand years preparing for war, Gaia and the Goddesses of Earth were preparing a different strategy. They had gathered twelve humans representing the ideals and achievements of humanity and lifted them up to become young gods. Gaia presented these twelve to Erishem as an offering to show mankind's great potential. Impressed, Erishem rendered their final judgment and decided that the Earth would be allowed to live. The fourth host then departed with the young gods, leaving the humans, the gods, the Eternals, and the Deviants to choose their own destinies. The Eternals continued to operate on Earth, and while their existence was no longer a secret, they were still relatively reclusive. Some of them, such as Gilgamesh and Circe, chose to fight alongside the mighty Avengers in defense of Earth. Cersei also developed a close bond with her teammate Dane Whitman, the Black Knight, although there was a love triangle between them and the Inhuman Crystal. There were further clashes with Deviants, such as the Sinister Gower, who was responsible for the death of Icarus's ally, Margo Damian. Gower attempted to drain the power of the Dreaming Celestial and use it for his own ends, but he too was defeated by the Eternals. 
Crow then took control of the Deviants himself, and a new truce was struck between the Eternals and the Deviants. He subsequently learned of and met the twin children he had conceived with Thena. Crow also worked with the US government on a project called the Delta Network, which sought to help Deviants who wished to integrate into human society. He even helped rescue the Avengers from Gower, and the two have battled for control of the Deviants. The twins also helped their father battle Gower on one occasion, displaying the ability to merge into a single entity called Dark Angel. Of course, the Eternals are still active in the Marvel Universe. If you want to read more, there's a six-issue limited series from 2006 by Neil Gaiman and John Romita Jr. that you should be able to jump into from here. The 2008 series by Nauf and Acuna continues from that one. For more on the Celestials, you can check out the Avengers story arc, The Final Host. After that is the current Eternal series by Kieran Gillen and Isad Ribic. If you want to dive right into the new stuff, you should be able to jump onto that book with the first issue. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next, and as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!